So I was going to prove that if X is UMDP, then LP of X is also UMDP. Right? Wrong color pen. I should have two different pens for my tablet, one for each color. <laughs> Be easier to get right. Let's prove this. All right. This is a Fabini argument and it's not even a difficult one. So let's just to avoid confusion, let's let Y be LP valued in X because I'm going to have LP valued in Y, right? And I don't want to confuse all of the LP valued in LP things. And we're going to prove that the UMD constant of Y is less than or equal to the UMD constant of X. Uh, the converse is an exercise. And actually for the converse, I, you also need that the measure of S is uh, greater than zero because there is a trivial case where the measure space is pretty much void, right? And then that's not enough to guarantee the UMD property of X because then you just get a collapsing space that says nothing, right? So we do need that. All right, so we're gonna prove that the UMD constant of LPX is less than or equal to that of X. Let's take a Y-valued Martingale on a probability space. And let's take a natural number n and look at the thing we need to estimate. Ah, I forgot, we need the sign sequence. Of course. And what are we looking at? We're looking at the LP norm valued in Y, which is LPX raise it to the peak power just to make everything a little bit simpler. Uh, and now we write out what Y is. Y is an LP norm over S. So we have Xi N, DFN of omega of S. Because DFN of omega is a function on S. And so we have an extra variable to play with. So this is the norm in X of that. D mu S, D P omega. Yeah, this is the whole argument basically. It's like taking an LP norm of an, of an LP norm is an LP norm again over the product space. Now, I say this every time, if you have two integrals, the first thing you do is Fabini. You do it completely mindlessly. You don't even think about it. You just do Fabini. It works every time. And you write out what you've got. Like so. And you notice that if you bracket out this part and you think, okay, I fixed S and I look at what's on the inside here. So you've got this DFN omega S and you think, okay, if X is fixed, what I've got here is a Martingale different sequence in X. So I write that as, actually, no, I'm, not, I'm just gonna do this all in one step. I say this here is controlled by the UMD constant of X to the pth power because I forgot to, well, I didn't forget them. So I'm not raising everything to the one and P here. S omega. And I have here the same thing, but without the signs. So this is just looking at the, this bracketed part for a fixed S and applying the UMD property of X. Is that clear? I guess you should, if you want to be really pedantic, you should check that this thing on the inside is actually a Martingale different sequence when you fix S, it is. For almost every S, it is, right? Because these things are only defined almost everywhere. And if you don't quite see that, go and check that yourself. That's a good thing to really think about personally. So then you do Fabini again. to get back to where you started. Oops, wrong order.
And yeah, this is where we started basically, but without the signs. And now this is in LP valued in Y. That's it. So this tells you that the UMD constant of Y being the best constant in this inequality is no bigger than this constant. And that's what we needed to show. Yes, yeah. You probably should check for yourself that this, this step really is justified that for almost every S, this thing in here really is a Martingale different sequence. And so you can apply the UMD property of X. At first it will be obvious and then you'll think, oh, hang on, maybe this is not obvious. And then once you understand it, it will be obvious again. Right. We're gonna move on to the P independence now. So before I do that, were there any questions? Have I forgotten anything? Everybody's happy. Good. I'm going to state the, the P independence theorem, but we're not going to be able to fully prove it yet. Well, we can prove it under an assumption today, but we're not going to prove that assumption until Thursday. Here's our theorem though. Suppose X is UMDP. For some p between one and infinity, then x is UMDP for all p between one and infinity, which means that x is UMD. So we don't really need to talk about the UMD property as a separate property, it's just the UMD property. You can verify it for one of these values p and you'll get it for all. So the proof which I won't do yet. The proof uses what's called Gundy's decomposition. Which is a result for martingales. Um, I'm going to state it later on, probably in five minutes, but we're going to prove it on Thursday. It's a result in stochastic processes. It's an abstract result for martingales and it has other applications. If you know harmonic analysis, it's basically the calderon zygmunt decomposition for martingales. All right. So before I go into what Gundy's decomposition is and before we really prove anything, let me just go straight to corollaries of the P independence of the UMD property because this will actually give us examples of UMD spaces. The following spaces uh, UMD. We're currently lacking in UMD spaces, so Hilbert spaces, we already know they're UMD too. So once you have P independence, we know that they're UMD. Uh, finite dimensional Banach spaces. Okay, of course, finite dimensional spaces are UMD. Um, finite dimensional spaces are always isomorphic to Hilbert spaces, and that's enough to prove that they're UMD. Or you can just use the finite dimensionality and prove the estimate directly. Just do it in coordinates or something. You can do that. Uh, every LP space where S is a measure space, which is sigma finite and P is between one and infinity. These are all UMD. We already know that they're UMD. Oh no, we don't even know that they're UMD P yet. I have to do that proof. And every Bochner space where X is UMD, S and P are as above. So actually this, this third result that every Lebesgue space, every reflexive Lebesgue space is UMD that follows from the fact that every Bochner space where X is UMD is also UMD. I don't need to prove this whole thing. I mean, we don't need to prove the result for Hilbert spaces or finite dimensional spaces. We see how that works. The only interesting thing is what happens with LP. And actually we only need to prove this one because the one above follows because LPS is LPS valued in the scalar field. The scalar field's finite dimensional, so it's UMD, right? Also it's a Hilbert space. 
Right, so if X is UMD, so I can write X in UMD, then X is UMDP. So LPX is UMDP and thus it's UMD. That's the proof, that's all it is. <laughs> There's really not much to prove here. Basically, once you know that Hilbert spaces are UMD2 and UMDP is preserved by taking LP spaces, if you know that, and if you know that you have the P independence, you suddenly get a bunch of examples because you can take Lebesgue spaces with P not necessarily equal to two, <laughs> right? They become UMD. There are more spaces, there are more examples in this. These aren't all the UMD spaces, of course. I should also add closed subspaces of UMD spaces are UMD. That's not hard to see. I mean, I think that's an exercise. Exercise one in this chapter, I think. If you have a space which is isomorphic to a closed subspace of a UMD space, that's UMD. UMD is, of course, preserved under isomorphism. And I haven't written it in the notes, but incidentally, this is how you show that Sobolev spaces are UMD. Because if you define them the right way, they're closed subspaces of, they're isomorphic to closed subspaces of LP spaces. You can take the fractional differentials or integral maps, and there will be the isomorphism to some LP space. It depends on how you define it. Anyway, don't think too hard about that. So yeah, we really need to prove the, the P independence of the UMD property to do anything useful. And as I said, that relies on Gundy's decomposition. which I'll at least state now so that we can use it. I need this much space. Take a Barnack space X and a probability space. Let's take F in L1 valued in X, which is normalized so that it's L1 norm is one just for convenience. We also take a filtration A, infinite generally, doesn't need to be finite. What does Gundy's decomposition say? It says, given a, a scale lambda greater than zero, there is a decomposition well, So you can write F as a sum of three functions, A plus B plus C, with A, B, and C all L1 functions. And these functions satisfy particular properties. So A, what does A satisfy? Its L1 norm is controlled by one up to a constant that's independent of everything. And furthermore, the probability that the supremum over n of the, the difference sequence of a n, not zero, is controlled by lambda to the minus one. I should add here a dot, b dot, c dot are the martingales with respect to a dot of a, b, and c. So a is small in L1. And the probability that one of the differences is non-zero is controlled. And this turns out to be useful in the application of this decomposition. What does B satisfy? What B satisfies is that the sum over N of the different sequence of B measured in X, measured in L1, that's also small, that's controlled by one. So B is quite small in L1 in a, in a quite strong sense. So this, this norm in X here, this is actually inside the sum. This is the sort of thing you usually can't control. It tells us B is so small that we can control this sum here. And finally C, C is bounded. It's L infinity norm 
is controlled by lambda. And it's also integrable. Well, we really know it's in L1, but it's L1 norm is controlled by one. So these are the properties of A, B, and C that we get. So C is a bounded part. A and B don't need to be bounded, but they're quite small in L1. Quite small in a certain sense. That's what these Kelder and Zingman type decompositions always tell you. You have like a bounded part and another part and the other part is controlled nicely enough and yeah, everything's all good. So today we're just going to assume this without proof. We'll prove it on Thursday probably. And we'll see how to get the P independence of the UMD property from that. I'll just highlight these. We're going to have to come back to that later on in this proof. Just I'll put a big arrow here so I know where to stop. So the main ingredient in this P independence of UMD, how do we prove P independence of UMD? It's much like how you prove the your Calder and Zygmunt theorem. Like if you have a Calder and Zygmunt operator and it's bounded on LP, how do you show that it's bounded on all LP? How do you go from one P to all P? You use the estimate you have at LP to prove what's called a weak type one, one estimate, which is like a, a weakened L1 inequality. And using this weak L1 inequality and the LP inequality, you can interpolate and you can get an LP inequality, or right, let's say an LQ inequality for all Q between one and P. So you can go from the P that you have to all P below that. And then we're going to use a duality argument to get all P above that. That's the, the sketch. If you've done harmonic analysis, you know this argument. If you haven't, you're going to see it. So the key ingredient is the weak one, one estimate, whatever that is. We take X to be UMD P space. Then we don't need the Gundy decomposition for this one. For all probability spaces, for all finite filtrations and sign sequences, this finite sign transform that we were working with before, these things that characterize the UMDP constant. These are bounded into the Lorentz space L1 infinity, the weak L1 space. We saw this in the Dube inequality. This is the, the endpoint we have for the Dube maximal operator. I'll just write out the definition of this norm. Supreme of T greater than zero. T times the probability that this function the norm of this function is greater than T. This is the, the definition of the L1 infinity norm or quasi norm really. This is controlled with the constant depending on P and X by the L1 norm of F. This is for all F in L1. And I said, we don't need the Gundy decomposition for this. And I lied, of course, we need the Gundy decomposition for this, right? So this is what I was calling the weak one, one estimate before. These finite Martin-Gale sign transforms are bounded from L1 into this space, weak L1. And this constant here, de oops, I don't want to cross it out. This constant here, it depends on P and X, but it doesn't depend on the choice of finite sign transform, right? We're going to have a, a length N filtration. This does not depend on N. And it doesn't depend on the choice of Xi. That's important. Proof. And yeah, we do assume Gundy's decomposition. Sorry, my headphones falling out. Here we go. Yeah. So let's take F in L1. And we can assume just by rescaling that the L1 norm of F is one. Okay, unless the L1 norm of F is zero, which means F is zero, but then there's nothing to prove because the left and right hand sides of the inequality both zero, yeah? If F is non-zero, we can rescale it so that it's got norm one, both sides rescale in the same way, it's all good. So we've got fix the scale T and let's take the Gundy decomposition of F. the Gundy decomposition at scale T. 
because remember we have a scale okay the way i phrased it in gundy's decomposition is we're given a lambda greater than zero this scale so we're going to take lambda to be t let's let f tilde be the the martingale transform uh, applied to f a tilde is the transform applied to a and so on. We're going to have B tilde and C tilde as well. So these Martin girl transforms are linear. So F is equal to A plus B plus C. So F tilde is equal to A tilde plus B tilde plus C tilde. That's fine. And we have this argument that I did the other day that I messed up. The probability that F tilde is greater than 3T we need this three is less than or equal to the probability that a tilde is greater than t plus the probability that b tilde is greater than t plus the probability that c tilde is greater than t because if the if f if the norm of f is greater than 3t then at least one of these has to oh hang on you can't have that all of these are less, all of these A and B and C are all less than T because then the sum would be less than 3T. This is the argument that I messed up the other day that I think Calvin corrected me on. Thanks again for that. And we're going to estimate these terms here separately on the right hand side. Using the properties that we get from the Gandhi decomposition. So let's start with A. What do we know about A from the Gundy decomposition? Okay, we know that it's in L1 and small, but we also have this property that the probability that's what, that one of the differences here is non-zero is also small. And A tilde is this martingale transform associated to A and that's made up of these differences. So we can say something from that. If this transformed A tilde is greater than T, remember that A tilde is the, the sum over N of Xi N D A N. If the norm of that's greater than T, then at least one of the terms D A N has to be non-zero. So this is less than the probability. Uh, hang on, I've lost my, yep, here we go. The probability that A tilde is greater than T is less than the probability that one of the distant the differences is non-zero. And Gundy tells us that that's less than or equal to a constant times T to the minus one, which is the sort of thing that we want. This is okay. That's actually enough. That's all we need for A. As for B, let's fix an omega in the probability space and look at B tilde of omega. Look at its norm in X. What do we know about B? B's got this property that it's so small in L1 that you can sum up the norms of the differences and still get a bound. So what B tilde is, is the sum of Xi n dBn of omega in X. And we can just do the really naive thing and use a triangle inequality here. Remembering that the Xi n's are all plus minus one. They don't affect the norms. And this is okay, this is enough. So the probability that B is greater than T in norm is less than or equal to the probability that the sum over N of DBN in norm is greater than T because B's norm is controlled by the sum of the DBN's norms like that. And Chebyshev's inequality tells us that, tells us that this is less than or equal to T to the minus one times the L1 norm of this function. That's Chebyshev. 
And this is precisely what we can control. We know that it's less than or equal to a constant. So we get the control by t to the minus one, just as we had for a, that's what we need. So that's a, that's b. Now we have to look at c. And we remember we haven't used the UMD property at all. We've kind of done nothing at this stage. All of the assumptions come in when you look at c. So we need to look at this probability, probability that c is large. So first let's use Chebyshev, but with LP instead of L1. So we get t to the minus p times the, the LP norm of this function, which is just the Martingale transform applied to C to the P. We've got that. And now we're looking at the LP norm of a Martingale sine transform. And these are precisely the things that the UMD property lets us control. So we've assumed UMD P and we're working with a P here. So this is controlled by a constant. It's going to be the UMD constant, but I don't care about it. Constant depending on P and X. T to the minus P, LP norm of C to the P. And now we think, what did Gundy's decomposition tell us about C? C was the term which is bounded. It's both bounded and it's in L1. We have control on the L infinity norm and the L1 norm. And this tells you actually that C's in LP for all P, in fact, between one and infinity. And it gives you some control on the norm. So remember the L infinity norm is controlled by lambda, L1 norm is controlled by one. What does this tell us about the LP norm? It tells us that that's controlled by something depending on P. So you can control the LP norm by the L1 norm to the one on P times the L infinity norm to the one minus one on P to the P. If you haven't seen this before, this is what's called the log convexity of the LP norms. So an LP norm can be controlled by a product of an L1 norm and an L infinity norm with appropriate powers. These powers sum up to one. That's the log convexity. It's not convexity, it's convexity of the logarithm. So these powers sum up to one. Uh, actually, there's no, this is just less than or equal to here. Now we know that these terms are controlled by some constants. Then we'll have constant to the power P, so the constant depends on P. So the L1 norm was controlled by one, yeah? So we just have one to the one on P. And the L infinity norm was controlled by lambda, lambda or lambda minus one? Lambda, yep. And not lambda, I'm taking to scale t, so lambda is t. One minus one on p to the p. So we have t to the minus p, the one does nothing, t to the p minus one, and that's t to the minus one, as with the other two terms. So you put all of this together and you see that the probability that this operator applied to F is greater than 3T. Now remember in the definition of the weak L1 norm, this Lorentz norm, we have a supremum over T of T times the probability that the function is greater than T. So we have a 3T here, we need to put a 3T there to compensate for it. This is less than or equal to 3t. And then we have the probability that a is greater than t, probability that b is greater than t, probability that c is greater than t. All of these were controlled by t to the minus one. So we have three of those. So we have this. And this is less than or equal to nine, which is less than or equal to a constant times one. <laughs> yeah. And one, the way we normalized f, one is the L1 norm of f. So we take the supremum over all, not over all t greater than zero, but over all three t greater than zero. It's the same set, right? If you take the supremum over all t, it's the same as taking the supremum over all three t. 
that gives you the result. All right. That's an important result. Does anybody have any questions about it? Okay. Uh, just remind me, um, yeah. what are the conditions for, does Chebyshev always work? Does it, does it need to depend on the finiteness of the, the measure space? Always or works. It works in general, right? Like I, yeah, it always like works, I, yeah. You're used right, to okay. it in probability, so you're used to doing it for probability spaces, but yeah, it always yeah, works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. It always works in any yeah. space. Right. That's good. Yep. Right. Ignore me then. It's yeah. Fine. Well, this was on a probability space anyway, so that's fine, but it does always work here. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. So just to remind ourselves what we proved, we proved this. These finite Martingale sign transforms are bounded from L1 to weak L1 uniformly, as long as the Barnack space has UMDP. And the nice thing about this is that you assume UMDP for some P and it doesn't matter which P you get, you get this weak L1 bound. The constants will depend on P and X, but who cares about that? The result doesn't depend on P other than that. So now we can prove the P independence of UMDP. We suppose X is a UMDP space. We want to prove that it's got UMDP for all P. We just start with one P. We fix uh, a sine transform. So a Martingale sine transform, a finite one, of course, I didn't mention that. T A dot Xi dot. So we fix a filtration and a sine sequence. What do we know about that? We know that it's bounded from LP to itself uniformly. When I say uniformly, I mean in the filtration and the sign sequence. That's the UMDP property. And we also know that it's bounded from L1 into weak L1. That was the previous result. So therefore, by what's called, if you don't know it, by the Machinkiewicz interpolation theorem, don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, I hope I am. I think I am. Exercise, go figure out how to pronounce this name. By this interpolation theorem, we know that these transforms are bounded from LQ to LQ for all Q between one and P, including P because we already have that result. I should say this is also uniformly. And we get the result uniformly as well. So we have uniform bounds at LP and weak L1. Then we deduce uniform bounds. Yeah, for LQ. I'll just notice something in chat. When, what's the exact same proof, Chebyshev? Okay, yeah, cool, I can ignore that. Yeah, so you have an LP bound and a weak L1 bound and you, you deduce the LQ bound for all Q between one and P. But we want it for all Q greater than P as well. So let's just say this tells you that X is UMDQ for all Q between one and P, but how do you go greater than P? We haven't proven any kind of L infinity estimate but we have the ingredients. By duality, X star is UMDP prime. And in fact, X star is UMD, let's say UMD R for all R between one and P prime. So we apply the same argument to the dual, which we know is UMDP prime and we get everything less than P prime. And when we dualize that, because we know that X is UMDQ if and only if X star is UMDQ prime, X is UMD R prime for all R between one and P prime, which is to say that it's UMD S for all S between 
p and infinity. <laughs> and that says that x is 0 and day, which is what we needed to show. It's a really nice duality argument. It's not too you know, difficult, but it's quite clever. Like if you can only, if you can only use this interpolation argument to go down, well, then you look at the dual and going down in exponents in the dual space corresponds to going up in exponents in the original space. Clever trick. Okay. I think that's all for today. We can end a little bit early. Obviously, I don't have time to prove Gundy's decomposition. That's probably going to take most of Thursday. So we'll finish here.